Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. Yes, we are studying the book of Galatians. We just finished Jonah, and now we move to the New Testament and look at the book of Galatians. And this is Paul's letter to the churches there in Galatia, which he wrote circa roughly 48 AD. This was kind of accounted for in Acts chapter 13 and 14. So you can read those chapters and get caught up to speed and see Paul on his missionary journeys. But there's one theme that we're going to see throughout these 146 verses, roughly. And there's one theme, and that is Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. If you have your Bible, you can turn over there and take a look at it with me. It's kind of a, an eerie moment when two apostles go head to head. And in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, you see Paul opposing Peter. And as he opposes him, he says one phrase that has changed more men's lives than any other phrase in all of Scripture. It's chapter 2, verse 14. Let me just read it for you. This is what Paul says. He says, But when I saw that their conduct, and that's the word orthopedic or orthopedo, when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. This is where we're going to launch from in this study. And you'll see it from Galatians chapter 1 to Galatians chapter 6. All the way to the very end is that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of the gospel, should radically change our behavior. Now, many of us have been in church for a very long time. And we've wanted to go on to higher and bigger doctrine. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the highest and the brightest and the best in all of Scripture. And it branches off into various sections. And one area of the gospel of truth is that it should be an orthopedic. It should straighten us. It should straighten our behavior. That there's one way for salvation. You see, false teachers had gotten into the church in Galatia. And they were teaching a false gospel with its subtleties. Because, you know, that's how Satan works. He works in the subtleties. Maybe you've been a part of a church at some point in your life. Maybe you came from a church to this church. And they talked about doctrine. And they loved the Westminster Confession of Faith. And they had conferences. And they wrote books. And they talked about doctrine. And yet, maybe there was a satanic subtlety that was running in the background. And that was, is your behavior in step with the truth of the gospel? The false teachers in Galatia had come in and said, yes, it's Jesus Christ for your salvation. These men had come down from Jerusalem. These are Jewish Christian men. They came down from Jerusalem and they said, you need to be saved, you Gentiles here in Galatia and it's a lot of different churches in the southern part of what we would now call Turkey and they said it's Christ and there's the subtlety Christ and Christ and circumcision Christ and keeping all of the different laws Christ and a certain mode and style of worship Christ and a certain way to dress when you go to church. Christ and a certain kind of music. Christ and. You see what I'm getting at? Paul was fired up. And he doesn't give a warm welcome in this letter. 
It's unlike any of other, his other letters. He doesn't say, well, how are you doing? How's it going? I love you. I've been praying for you. This is an exigent epistle. He gets straight to the point. And he says, you're being led astray. You're being troubled by other people. They've been preaching to you a false gospel, a different gospel. If there is any other kind of gospel, there's only one gospel. And he said, you've been led astray. How many of us have been in church for 30, 40, 50 years? Oh, we heard the gospel message. You're saved by grace through Christ alone. And then at some point, maybe a pastor, maybe a session, maybe officials in the church began to feed you subtleties to add to your salvation. You can only truly be saved if it's Jesus plus, and we're going to keep a track of all your attendance here at church. Ooh, that might have touched a nerve. Sorry. It's true. There's one way for salvation. Do you feel free today in Christ? If you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you're probably not feeling very free. But if you're a Christian, do you feel free in Christ? These are the words of Paul from Galatians chapter 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We submit ourselves to yokes of slavery each and every day. Why? Because we forget the gospel. We turn to a different gospel. And Paul's very adamant that if anyone turns to a different gospel, let him be eternally damned. Those are his exact words. So we would do well to pay attention to the true gospel. And Paul's going to give it to us repeatedly from Galatians chapter 1 to Galatians chapter 6. And he's going to touch on several themes. But he says to them in a very stern voice, he says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who's cast a spell upon you? Has it happened in the church to you ever? Someone casting a spell saying it's Jesus and A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It happens each and every Lord's Day where ministers get up in a pulpit and they will preach and they will preach a gospel and that gospel of Jesus Christ will have add-ons. It will have various things that they'll say, yes, but you must do this and you must do that in order to truly be saved, to be accepted into God's family. Have you been lied to or have you lied to yourself? Because we can do this as well. What is your circumcision? What's that thing you've been adding to Christ for your salvation? Maybe it's the book of church order. Uh-oh, now I got real. The book of church order. How many times have you heard that in a Presbyterian church? Almost as if the book of church order rules out the scripture and it's better than the gospel of Jesus Christ. The letter will never change you according to scripture. The letter, even the book of church order, will only do behavior modification for a period of time. What do we need for our hearts to change? The gospel of Jesus Christ. He will change us from the inside out, not from the outside in. Now, some of you are very uncomfortable at this point because I've been calling out the book of church order. And maybe you've been told by pastors that the book of church order is the thing to look to for all rules, regulations, and behavior. No! He just said here from Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, you're not in step with the truth of the gospel. So as the pastor of this church, I'm calling you back to the gospel. Some of us have forgotten the gospel. We've been so caught up in the Booker Church order. We've been caught up in certain denominations and ways of thinking. And Paul says, you got to go back to the gospel. Peter, you're sitting there eating pork with your best friends who are Gentiles. And when your Jewish buddies show up, you push back. I don't know these guys. They're unclean. Have we done that? Have we pushed back? Have we forgotten the gospel? Are we no longer in step with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a very controversial letter. It changed many men's lives. It changed the Patristic Fathers. It changed Augustine. It changed John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Knox, the Puritans. This one letter is an atomic 
bomb that will explode. And I would say to you, if you want to change, if you really want to follow Christ, read Galatians. If you don't want to step, change and you'd like to stay a stick in the mud, don't read Galatians. And probably don't come back to any other services. Because this letter is going to irritate you to no end. And it will make you change. And you'll fall more in love with Jesus because he is fairest Lord Jesus. He is greater. He is brighter. He is more pure. And there's one way for salvation. It's by grace through faith. And this is not our own doing. And it's never Christ plus something else. It's never Christ and something else. And we functionally elevate things in our lives. Now, just for a couple of the themes that we're going to be studying. And again, it will be controversial. He's going to study with us the true gospel versus the false gospel. Faith versus works. Law versus grace. Liberty versus legalism. Sonship versus slavery. That's a good one. Works of the flesh versus fruit of the spirit. And Paul is going to raise a question. Who are the true sons of Abraham? Now this is controversial in our day. And then at the very end, he's going to say, the Israel of God. After he's gone through 140-something verses, talking about it's Christ and Christ alone, and then he says, the Israel of God. Who's the Israel of God? This is coming from a Jewish guy. Oh, this will be controversial if you read the book and take it at face value instead of maybe what you've been taught or what you've heard in the past. Now, this is a covenant theology church. We're not dispensationalist, so this might disturb you. Nevertheless, this book of the Bible has set more people free to move away from functioning saviors that are created things to be able to embrace the true gospel, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the person and his work of what he's done on our behalf. However, these false teachers came in and they immediately say about Paul, he wasn't with Jesus or the disciples. He's teaching a false gospel to you. He's an imposter. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And so they call out his authority. Number one, Paul doesn't know what he's doing. Number two, they're going to combat against the gospel of grace. And if you'll recall, in Acts chapter 15, there was a massive meeting with all of the high officials in the Christian church. You have James and Peter. Paul's there. And this is a presbytery meeting, as it were, to discuss how are we truly saved? Is it salvation in Christ alone? Or is it salvation in Christ plus are there other things that we need to be doing in order to be truly saved? And when all the great minds of the church descend upon one place and they have a presbytery meeting or a general assembly about one topic, you know it's a big deal. And when they leave from that meeting, there's one way of salvation and it's Christ and Christ alone. Do you feel free today? Free in Christ, knowing that your salvation is in him and him alone. Jesus stood up in the synagogue. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he says, He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is Jesus' opening message. He wants to set the captives free. So if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. How many of you like fishing? I like fishing. It's fun. How many of you have ever caught a fish and put it on the dock? What does it do? It flops around everywhere. It's kind of ugly. See, that fish is outside of its natural home. It doesn't have the legs to get up and walk. And so it struggles and it flops until hopefully it can get itself flopped back into the water. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. We are made for our God. Made by him and for him. 
And we don't do well in water, do we? We do great on land. God has designed each creature for its own purpose and its own habitation. And our habitation is in God through Christ and by the power of the Spirit. When we step outside the gospel and begin to live some other Christian lifestyle, and you've heard this, some other kind of lifestyle, we act just like that fish on the dock. We flop around, gasping, struggling. But in the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're now free. You're free to actually obey the law. See, there's this tension in the Christian faith. Well, these false teachers came into trouble to people, and there's one thing they started out to do, and that is to undermine, to innervate, to erode Paul's apostleship. So let's jump into this text, and let's just see Paul and see how he starts this letter. Go back to the text. He says this, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. How does Paul start this letter? He starts it with himself. Was Paul a narcissist? Well, of course not. He's not a narcissist. Don't be foolish. Paul starts with himself because of the original setting. As I've just said, these false teachers had come into, and they're called the circumcision party, by the way. That's how Paul labels them in Galatians chapter 2. But this circumcision party, that's how you can always tell somebody who, who they really want to be known by. You've seen this in the Christian church. There are certain you know, brands inside the Christian church. You know, we have certain people who like to worship this way or worship that way, or we do a certain kind of healing, and if you come down front, we'll heal you. Uh, there are certain brands, certain things that people put forward as the main thing. Paul says, these guys put circumcision in the forefront. Yes, Christ, yes, but you need to be circumcised. Yes, we point back to the Old Testament. And Paul's going to cut them to the heart here in just a minute. However, Paul says, Paul, an apostle, and notice this, not from men. Not from men. He'll explain this a little bit further in chapter 1 about the revelation of Jesus Christ that was made known to him. But he starts out by saying, I did not receive my apostleship from man. No set of men ordained me. You see, that's what happens with us, it was with me, my dad, other men who are ordained. We have to be ordained by a body. I'm ordained by Vanguard Presbyterian Church. I first was ordained by the church, of a Southern Baptist church when I first started preaching. You couldn't tell that, could you? And then I was ordained in the PCA, yes, Presbyterian Church of America. I've been ordained in three different places. But I was ordained, I had hands laid on me by men, and then sent out to preach, to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says no man ever laid a hand on him to ordain him. It didn't come through a set body of men, but where did it come from? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ and God the Father. You see what he's doing? He's giving a rebuttal to these people who were trying to undermine his apostleship. Remember, those false teachers are saying to the people in Galatia, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He was never with Jesus. Oh, but Paul says he was with Jesus. In order to be an apostle, there are two qualifications. You had to see the risen Lord Jesus and be with him. That's why we have people in our day who call themselves apostles. There are no longer any apostles. No one has seen the resurrected Lord Jesus. If you go through the New Testament, this is the qualification to be an apostle. You spent time with the risen Lord Jesus. We love to label ourselves with names that seems pretty astonishing, right? So today we have people who call themselves apostles. Apostle so-and-so down at so-and-so church. He really hears from God. Or if you're in the Mormon church, our apostles said this. Really, he saw Jesus. Man, he got off the boat with Noah too, right? I'm being facetious and sarcastic. I hope you could pick up on that. Paul says, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ 
and God the Father. Acts chapter 9, verse 15, we see it's where Jesus came down, makes a return trip to convert Paul on the Damascus Road. And here's what Jesus says in Acts 9, 15. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Jesus chose Paul. Jesus spent time with Paul. He spoke with him. He appointed him. He chose him, and he sent him out to preach the gospel. What's the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's a message of grace. Paul was never looking to become an apostle. Remember, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He was a high-ranking man in Phariseeism. He, he actually probably had the equivalent of eight PhDs. He was a brilliant intellect, a towering intellect of his time. And he was on his way to persecute to murder Christians, to drag them out of their homes. When's the last time you had your door knocked on and somebody wanted to drag you out? Most of the time when they knock on your door, they just want your money. They're trying to give you a new roof, trying to give you new windows. You've had this, I've had this problem. But Jesus says, Paul's mine. And I'm going to change his life from being a religious zealot a man who knew all kinds of theology. See, this is what you have to listen for in the church today. You can go to a church where somebody speaks as if they know a lot of high theology, but they may be empty of the gospel. They may never say the word grace. They may never even preach what the true gospel is. And that is, it's through Jesus Christ and Him alone. See, many people won't preach the gospel. Many pastors won't preach the gospel because they're trying to rule over you or lord over you. I'm not trying to do that. And when we get a session in place, if you feel like this, that they're starting to do, come talk to us. Because maybe their behavior will not be in step with the truth of the gospel. You see, people will say truth claims are just power moves. Except for this one. But you see, the gospel of Jesus Christ frees people. It frees them not to be under some power claim, some power move. I hope you realize the leadership team in this church has not been trying to lord over you anything. We've been preaching a message of starts with a G, ends with an E. Anybody got a clue? Grace. It's grace. How do we interact with each other? Through grace. How do we love one another? Grace. When someone comes to you and starts trying to lord things over you, run. Flee. It's satanic. Jesus says he came to release you of those burdens. If you don't like the message of grace, you really don't like Christianity. And you're going to see at least over 20-something times, maybe even more, Throughout this letter, how Paul is going to preach the gospel, and he's going to talk about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace. He's taking these people back to the central message. And the problem is, these Pharisees don't like it because it's a power move. Oh, you're saved by Jesus, but you guys need to come see us because you need to be in our tribe. We're circumcised, and you're not, you pathetic Gentiles. Oh, you're saved like Jesus, but you need to wear a suit and tie every single Sunday or you're really not saved. Now, I know I'm being facetious, but this is what Paul's doing. He even goes so far to say, you know, those who are pressing these things upon you, this tribalism, I wish they'd just go ahead and emasculate themselves. Those are strong words if you know what the word emasculate means. Paul's not joking around about the gospel. We allow all kinds of things to move and maneuver into our lives that become ultimate. They're secondary, tertiary things, yet we elevate them to be on par with Jesus Christ. You know, this is what happened in the Catholic Church. 
the Catholic Church said it's Christ, and then you've got these seven things that you also need to do in order to really be saved. And you can only be saved if you're a member of this church. And there were subtleties. And during the Protestant Reformation, a Catholic man by the name of Martin Luther discovered the epistle to the Galatians. Coupled with Romans, and he realizes, I've been living a lie. The Catholic Church has been teaching me a lie. And the bad thing was, he was a professor in seminary. And he's teaching other seminarians that you're saved through Jesus Christ, plus this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and the list just keeps on going. And today in Judaism, they have 613 of these ands. And this, and that. What's our and? See, this is where the tribalism of these circumcision party comes in to undermine his authority. And they say he doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't listen to him. You really need to be a part of our team, our tribe. If you ever go to a church and you feel like pressure from leadership or people there, and I mean the kind of pressure that you need to cave to certain ways of living and behavior styles, you need to flee from that church because those are satanic subtleties. Paul will actually say that. I know this is wild to hear these kinds of words from the Apostle Paul, but he says it's through Jesus Christ that he was made an apostle and God the Father. But what's his authority? What's the real authority? We'll go back to the text. He says, who raised him from the dead. Paul points to the authority of Jesus Christ being risen from the dead. He doesn't start with the miracle birth or miracle conception, natural birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't start with the life, the wonderful miracles of Jesus. He, he doesn't even talk about the death of Jesus on the cross to begin with. He starts with the resurrection. And he says that resurrection has all the power. Remember Romans says that Jesus was raised for our justification. Here it is. It's the big theme. The gospel is not everything. It's very narrow. And yet there are many branches to the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I said a minute ago, there are various themes that you're going to see. Faith. Grace. But here... He starts with the resurrection. Why would Paul start with the resurrection? Because it's the highest authority. The Lord Jesus was perfect in every way, and death could not hold him down, and he rose. And Paul actually says in 1 Corinthians that he went around preaching the message to other people, showing himself, witnessing himself. You can see this at the end of John's gospel. He's showing proof of the resurrection. This is exactly why Paul starts with the resurrection. He says, because he rose and we are justified before God. The Bible says we're condemned before God. All of us, from Adam and Eve, by ordinary generation, all of their posterity, all who flow from Adam and Eve, our, we're all condemned. And none of us can stand justified upright before a holy God. You just sang the hymn, holy, holy, holy. He's holy, we're unholy. What does that mean? It means we deserve eternal damnation. We're all crooked. Every single one of us. None are righteous. No, not one. We deserve a lake of burning fire. That's what our sins deserve. And each one of us have sinned. And maybe we've sinned even this morning. Maybe we've sinned even in this worship service. We can't possibly come to God and say, here's my resume. But we do that, don't we? And there's pride and there's sin. 
What are you going to say when you stand before God the Father? Well, I was a good person. I did this. I helped these people. I gave away this amount of money. What's he going to say? Come on in. You're, you're a great guy. You've done a lot of good work. No, that's Allah. That's workspace. So this is the leveler for all of us. You have no standing before God. Zero. But I have a family. He doesn't care. It's not about your family. It doesn't justify you. Oh, but I have plenty of wealth. It doesn't justify you. All men are cut off at the knees. And we're all crippled. And we all are condemned before God. And there is no way to give a plea to him to accept us instead of cast us off into hell. None. But the circumcision party says, you can stand before God. You can be righteous before him if you trust in Christ and, and you're circumcised. We do this in the church too, don't we? Um, you can be saved if you trust in Christ plus if you are a dispensational premillennialist. Oh, you can go to heaven if you trust in Christ and you're amillennial. Oh, you can go to heaven if you trust in Christ and you are post-mill. No. No. Boy, that was distracting, wasn't it? Geese flying by. Squirrel, I have ADD, sorry. The gospel message is this. One way. Jesus says, I am the multiple ways. Jesus says, it's me plus your church affiliation. No. Some of you need to be freed today. You've been coming to this church long enough. You've been taught lies. And your conduct is not in step with the truth of the gospel. And when you embrace the real message of grace, it'll change you. It'll change how you relate to other people, how you interact with other people. And it will change all of your life from A to Z. It'll change how you love your wife. You'll be free to love her as Christ loves you. You'll even be so free in Christ to love your mother the way you've never loved her before on this Mother's Day. Why? Because your salvation, your justification is in Christ and Christ alone and nothing else. Some of you have been working extremely hard in your jobs for a long time to justify yourself. I make lots of money. Look at me. I've justified myself. I was just some poor hick from West Cobb. Now I'm justified. No. You know, sometimes the hardest thing to do is to give yourself grace and to accept the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ instead of trying to earn your salvation through the ands of life. Here he says... I'm writing this church to the churches in Galatia, and there are many churches who've been infiltrated by this horrendous gospel message of the circumcision party. We didn't get very far this morning. I understand. If this has piqued your interest at all, I invite you to come back next week so we can maybe finish the first two verses and move on to the next three. This is going to be a study you won't forget. And maybe the Holy Spirit is going to begin to change your heart so that you are free in Christ and you're free to live out his commands and be obedient and feel as though they are life-giving and also to spot heresy so that you're not given over to it by other churches, pastors, or even yourself because we are sinners there are times that we will put ands in our lives 
in order to feel justified before God. Let's pray.